Um, we're going to hear an amazing tale today of a uh, computing environment in Livermore. And one of the things that might occur to you is what happens to all of this old equipment after it doesn't make sense to run it anymore? Does it turn into landfill or does it get recycled for scrap metal? And the answer is, unfortunately, sometimes yes. In fact, often yes. Uh, but you may be pleased to know that a lot of what was done at Livermore, in fact, is being preserved. About a year and a half ago, Lawrence Livermore Labs donated to the Computer History Center most of their historical collection of computers, which include 6600, 7600, Cray-1, part of the um, Octopus networking system, automated tape libraries, just an amazing collection of material. And we have it all stored up in a warehouse on Moffett Field. Uh, along with thousands of other computers that the Computer Museum in Boston has been collecting over the last 15 years. The historical collection of that museum has moved out here to Moffett Field. Our eventual intention is to open a publicly accessible computer museum and history center uh, showcasing the hardware, software, and documentation, film, video collection that we have. Right now, we don't have a public location. We have a, uh, by invitation only, uh, visible storage warehouse. Uh, if you're interested in helping us preserve the history of computers in the world in general and in all time, uh, join us. We'd uh, very much like you to have you part of the organization. Uh, you have a one-time opportunity from now until June 31st this year to become a founding member of the Computer History Center, much like people became founding members of the Boston Computer Museum in 1984. And several people have said to me that they regret never having become a founding member of that. Well, don't lose your opportunity to become a founding member of the Computer History Center back here. Uh, join us. There'll be some materials in the back that you can pick up or email us to chc at tcm.org, Computer History Center at tcm.org. Uh, we have a great time. We're having a wonderful collection being built and continue to be built and uh, invite you all to, to help us preserve the history of this fantastic revolution that we've created. I'll now turn it over to Peter. Thanks. Okay, and I'm Peter Nerkse and I and Jeannie Trichel also from Sun are make up Bay Area computer history perspectives and we started the original system, series of historical talks now almost five years ago. <laughs> And the very first talk in the series was about computing at Livermore in 1963. So we picked that particular year. That was, at that time, 30 years before. And it was remarkable. Like John Ranaletti, who was one of the speakers, had made a computation that uh, if you added the total core memory of all the computers at Livermore in 1963, it was two megabytes. <laughs> if you think... You go to Fry's, you can't even buy two megabytes. You know, it's like <laughs> the minimum is like eight, and it costs twelve dollars for the cheap model. And if you think, what would people have thought thirty-five years ago if you told them all that main memory of all the computers at Livermore would be available thirty-five years later for twelve dollars at a retail store? Uh, no, no one would have believed it. But I think we can be sure 35 years from now, equally surprising things will happen. And that's one of the big benefits of learning from history, how much <coughs> can change. So now we're going back to Livermore. And right, we have George Michael here, who's one of the speakers in that first program. Also Norm Hardy in the second row, who's one of the speakers. And Gordon Bell in the back row here, who then was in the front row. And <laughs> yes. We had a small audience, but a distinguished audience that time. All right, so uh, I would like to now introduce George Michael, who, as I, I mentioned in the announcement, arrived at Livermore, I believe this is correct, within one week of the first computer that arrived at Livermore. All right, George. Thank you. Thank you. Mentioned we'll try and keep the program sort of interactive. You're welcome to ask questions and I will come around with the microphone if you have a question so we can record it on the tape. <coughs> well, good evening. Uh, I see at least two young people here, so the two things that I was going to talk about, I'll change to three and try to give you just a very brief five minutes or so. Uh, background of Livermore, where did we start, why are we there? And so that's the way it, turned out was this. <clears throat> Robert Oppenheimer was the head of the development of the atomic bomb at Los Alamos. One of the persons who was there was Edward Teller. He didn't work very much on the bomb. He worked on a thing called the super. 
was a hydrogen bomb, and he always wanted to see it developed. He had an idea about how to do it. Turns out, I think that it would have been incredibly difficult to build what he wanted. After the war was over, he was agitating both here in Washington and any center of power he could find to get people to pay attention to that. And uh, But one of the staff members at Los Alamos is a Polish mathematician by the name of Stanislaus Ulam, pulled him aside and told him about an idea about how to build a super. And Teller's mind was essentially prepared. He saw a sweet technical solution, and he seized on it. He went back to a special meeting hosted by Oppenheimer at the Institute for Advanced Study and presented this idea, and everybody there was prepared, and they said, that's great. Okay, this is 1950. He's still unhappy because the work that's proceeding at Los Alamos isn't going fast enough. So they finally said, look, if you'll be quiet, we'll give you this old abandoned airfield outside of Livermore. And uh, they, they didn't trust Edward to do this by himself, so they went to E.O. Lawrence and arranged through him a thing called the Whitney Contract, and that was the birth of Livermore. Was an, it's called Engineering 48, okay? and the idea, it had four or three projects, depending on how you want to count. One was the development of nuclear explosives. One was the development of peaceful, um, controlled release of thermonuclear energy. And one was the study of the interaction with radio radioactivity with biological material. Those things are still in place at Livermore. One of the best things that happened to Livermore then was that they had the guidance of some very brilliant people, among them John von Neumann, probably the often called the, the best mathematician in the 20th century. <clears throat> he prevailed on the people who started Livermore to uh, compute rather than experiment. In other words, all of the things that you wanted to do on the development of nuclear energy would be done through computation. And so even before the laboratory was actually going, which is in September of 1952, an order had been placed for a thing called a univac. I don't know if any of you can see all of that up there, but. Well, why don't we just shut off this light here? That'll That'll help. Well, there's a switch up there somehow. We got the wrong lights. <laughs> so anyway, the UNIVAC, to give you some sense of perspective, had a thousand word memory. Each, each word was 12 decimal characters. So you could say it's a 12 kilobyte memory, if you wish. And um, it was the workhorse for the entire laboratory in 19... 53. It arrived in late April of, a, of 1953, and uh, I arrived on the 7th of, uh, 15th of April in 1953, and I'm not sure which was the, the most uh, earth-shattering event, but uh, the UNIVAC was a cantankerous thing. It, it was down as much as it was up. It took two months to get it set up to run. Today, you go to the store and buy something vastly more complicated, plug it in and it runs. So that's the background that started Livermore. And it also tells you that the bias at Livermore was compute, compute, compute. And this is a list of computers that were uh, at Livermore in the first X years. They're in number of about 40 of actual kinds. and. Uh, uh, they were characterized always by being the fastest that was available at that instant within the constraints of certain kinds of politics and stuff like that. Now, the third thing I wanted to tell you about is that there was a lot of raw hardware. Nobody knew anything about uh, software. It didn't, the word didn't exist, much less the fact. And as a consequence, the Livermore people grew up having to do a lot of stuff on their own, okay? building hardware in some cases, but certainly building all kinds of weird software to support these machines as they were brought in. 
tonight, I, I think my, three of my colleagues will be telling you about the early adventures, in some sense, of operating systems as people grope their way into so-called computer science. And uh, I think I've said my, my piece at that. Now, I'd like to introduce Dick Watson, who will do the rest of the introductions as these things are finished. I'll show Seventy thirty was not. Uh, Univac, of course, was. And um, I think we had serial number 17 of the PDP, which was what we called our romper room. It was a place where people worked out ideas that would go in, into the larger machines. But let Dick tell you about all this wonderful stuff that happened as a result. Okay. Okay, okay thanks. So let's see, first of all, I have to apologize. There's a little bit of, of, of lack of truth of, of advertising. Uh, it, it is on here. OK. Someone's only going in there, right? Um, I actually didn't show up to Livermore till 76. And uh, so I'm going to talk to you uh, in my little piece of this talk primarily about uh, some things that, uh, that happened after 76 that we thought were pretty important um, and then we got killed by Unix uh, so then we realized we weren't so important um, and John is gonna uh, talk John uh, of, of the three of us uh, has, you know, got there the earliest and so he'll talk about a lot of the early early work in the in the network uh, because we really believe at Livermore uh, that we sort of invented client-server computing um, and uh, uh, so some of the early, early work there. And then Jed's going to come back uh, and talk some more about some of the things that I started talking about. Plus, he has a miscellany of, of, of interesting little uh, historical bits and pieces, I think, that he's going to bring up. So what we'd like to do as we're talking is, is interact, OK? Uh, uh, because that seemed like the most fun thing to do. And it would jog our memories. Uh, it's a little scary to be up talking about history, right? I mean, suddenly you're part of history. Uh, and and uh, you know, I think I've had enough midlife crises, and this, is, uh, this might trigger another one. So, OK. So this is just our little title slide. And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about operating system and, and, and networking development. So let, uh, this is a little slide we put together to sort of try to indicate some of the historical sort of convergences of, of pieces that, that, that came along here in time. So back uh, up, up in time, back in the 60s, okay, as George said, when, when, when serial one CDC machines or Cray machines came in the door, they didn't come with any software. So we had to write the operating systems, we had to write all the compilers, et cetera. Um, and, uh, so back about the same, okay, thank you, Eugene. So back about, as you all know, uh, uh, in the 60s, you know, one of the major things that was happening in, in, in operating system uh, research was Multics at MIT. And if you go back and read any of those papers uh, uh, on Multics, you realize what a really rich uh, environment uh, and, and what a, a bunch of perceptive things there were in that arena. Well, Multics, as you'll hear from John, came into the Livermore world both because time sharing was something we wanted to operate with at Livermore. We didn't want to do batch computing. We want the scientists to be able to stand up there online and interact with their, 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 their simulations. So that was a key idea. Another key idea in Multics was its uh, you know, general graph kind of file structure and you'll see when, you when John talks about how we brought that in as sort of the first client-server shared file system in the, in the environment. Um, so that, that all came into Livermore in the, in the 60s, and John's going to talk about that. 
Jed's going to talk about some uh, work that was uh, research work in secure computing uh, uh, that was going on at Livermore. And of course, the ARPANET was just getting started in the 70s. Uh, and uh, I was involved uh, at SRI at that time uh, with the first Telnet protocol and FTP and so on. And one of the things that was very clear to me, being an operating system kind of person, was that we were doing it all wrong, even though I was participating in doing it all wrong. Um, and so I went to ARPA and I said, look, all these protocols, FTP, Telnet, etc., this is the wrong way to think about what we're doing. We're building a distributed operating system. And we ought to start talking like that and thinking like that. And uh, because I really believe that notation and language really affects how you think and the kind of questions you ask and where you go to get information and who you talk to. And the folks at ARPA said, Dick, forget it. Don't, I, we don't want to hear you talking like that anymore because with Multics, Congress believes operating system research is finished. <laughs> okay? And that, <laughs> that therefore we can't talk like that. And so a, a little later we came up with a, with a project which we called um, the National Software Works, which was another version of a distributed operating system. And again, we couldn't call it an operating system, and we, again, we asked the wrong questions, did the wrong thing. So instead of building FTP, we should have been building file services, for example. Instead of building Telnet, we should have been bu building terminal services, etc. Uh, but we didn't do that. So when I came to SRI, I mean to, to Livermore in, in 76, uh, I, I brought that frustration with me and I wanted to fix all that. Um, and so that was part of what I want to talk a little bit about. Um, now, there were a lot of other things going on in the world. Uh, the, the concept of a capability, and Jed's going to talk some more about that uh, for protection, because we really pushed that quite a bit. And then in the 80s, when we were starting to build NLTSS, uh, uh, Los Alamos was also doing a, a new operating system called Demos. Uh, and then, of course, Mock and some of these other folks started talking about microkernels. But we thought we, we'd already been doing that for, for some time, object-oriented, et cetera. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about all of those kinds of things. So in terms of the operating systems at Livermore, the, uh, the F Frost flow system, Norm Hardy was involved in all of those things evolved into what's called LTSS, or at the NERSC Center, uh, they called it CTSS for Cray time-sharing system instead of Livermore time-sharing system. Uh, and then in the late, uh, late 70s, when the Crays were arriving, we thought we'd give it one more uh, whirl and build another new operating system. And that's a little bit what I'm, Jed and I are going to be talking about. And of course, Unix was back here, and I'm going to I got another view graph I want to show, and, uh, and it just kept rolling along and uh, eventually steamrolled all of us. Um, now, a lot of this work uh, you know, died at the end of the 80s, uh, and uh, it, it, it still exists, however. Some of the architectural concepts in the IEEE reference model for mass storage and in a high-performance storage system that I will talk about briefly. The other thing that, that's important it, that we're going to be talking about has to do with networking from sort of a star network environment. I don't know what you call that. Uh, uh, that was everything connected to everything else uh, with all the different protocols and different hardware and so forth. Uh, we had a major battle uh, around 77, 78 because we wanted to go use the hyper channel and there were still folks in the engineering department who had built all this who wanted to build it again. Uh, and, um, and, and of course, if, if we software folks had been a little more prescient, we would have realized uh, we just killed them in 78, and then the world came along and killed us uh, in the same way uh, at the end of the 80s uh, for the same reasons and, and with the same arguments. OK. So let me just take a, a, a cut here. Uh, what you're going to see on, on, on a number of these view graphs, you're going to see dates like 89 or 90. I just went back and found a pile of, of uh, old floppies I had around. But a lot of the work that I'm going to be talking about was at, actually took place uh, in, in between like 76 
and maybe 81, 82, the basic architecture of, of, of what we're talking about. Um, so anyway, we had primarily batch systems in the 50s and 60s uh, with the first time-sharing supercomputer operating systems at Livermore. Then we had the uh, second generation again in the mid-60s. Um, and the, the most prominent ones uh, uh, were the ones that I've listed here. Again, this is LTSS or CTSS uh, at, at Lawrence Livermore Lab. This was an interesting system. It was, it was one of the first uh, operating systems written in a higher level language. Uh, and it had you know, a lot of, of, of very powerful features. Uh, and it was running on some very poor hardware from a system programming point of view. Okay. Um, so that was the second generation. So then we went to the, the third generation here, where we have virtual memory. We've got all kinds of uh, more flexible naming, access controls, sort of crude inter, inter process communication at the time. And so we, we've got Unix and VMS and Multics. Um, and then in the 80s, there was this sort of upwell of interest in trying to get to the next generation. Uh, so you had Mach, the domain operating system with Apollo. We had NLTSS and various things at, at, at some of the university worlds. Uh, and the sad thing from my point of view is we never made it to the fourth generation. The world is still stuck back in the third generation. Yes. Yeah, and, and yeah, the question was, were, you know, were there other early ones uh, back there in the second generation? Uh, and there were uh, uh, on the PDP-1. The PDP-1 had several uh, early time sharing and operating systems uh, at, at several places, including Stanford, MIT, BBN, et cetera. Uh, yeah, or early versions of, 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 of what became CTSS. Uh, that's not completely true. The SDS 940, which was originally done at, at, Laura, at uh, UC Berkeley, was supported by scientific data systems, uh, but that was in the 60s. Uh, I, I think I, supplied by DEC. That's right. Yeah, in the back. Where do I put NT? I, I, I view NT, and maybe uh, others here can correct me, Gordon in particular. I, I view NT as VMS warmed over. Uh, 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 so I don't view, uh, so I do not view NT as a, as, as, as a new thing. You know, uh, all, the, all the great experience that, that, that the folks at DEC had with VMS, you know, they just took the human beings and they brought them to Microsoft and they redid it. Um, so anyway, so from a history point of view, we sort of died in terms of development, you know, back here. And a lot of the, the, the key characteristics of what I think of as the fourth generation was this view that communication is fundamental, okay? In other words, in the, in the, in the third generation with things like Unix, even with Multics, my view was that interprocess communication, communication was kind of an afterthought, uh, sort of tacked on, whereas these, these operating systems were, were built around the idea that communication was sort of the central thing uh, that, w that was going on. So that basically what was happening here was we went from an environment where communication was sort of, as I say, the sort of afterthought that you kind of tacked on to the idea here in this fourth generation where the idea is to build an operating system that can span even heterogeneous hardware, and it's an integrated, uniform API, you know, a uniform, coherent environment. Okay, and that's certainly what we were trying to do with with uh, what we called links or NLTSS. 
Okay. So, and we're still struggling. This is a this is a recent view graph at Livermore. We're still trying to get there. Okay. Uh, we have a program at Livermore called the Accelerated Strategic Computing Initiative (ASCII), where we're bringing in these multi-teraflop uh, machines, and. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, and the idea here, uh, I mean, this isn't me making this view graph. This is other people in, in, the, in the computing environment at Livermore. You know, they're still trying to, to, to get us into the network is the computer. I mean, we've heard that, right? Uh, uh, uh. Okay, so I'm going to go back a little bit here in history and talk about this Lynx NLTSS architecture. And we started this work, I think, around 78. Uh, and maybe Bob or Jim or anybody can correct me if I got that wrong. But it was about 78. And we had several key ideas that we wanted to, to, to manifest in this, in this environment. Uh, first of all, we wanted this to be a distributed operating system. And so we were going to have client server message passing. Now, there's sort of two, two kind of views you can take of communications in the world, so to speak. One is, think of it as, as procedure call, in which the idea here is to create the logical model that everything is local. You know, just like your, you know, your local operating system, your interface is a procedure call to the operating system. And so you think of it as trying to get something done on a remote machine as a procedure call kind of environment. Or you can take the model, everything is remote logically, and think of it as message passing. And there are pros and cons, and I'm not going to go into all that. But we, we took the, the particular view that, that uh, we were going to do the message passing model here. And we wanted to standardize you know, all the syntax and the parameter encoding, because our, our fantasy, again, was we were going to run this on very heterogeneous systems. We were going to have file servers running on you know, brand X, brand Y. We'd have supercomputing uh, operating systems. We'd have terminal services over here, et cetera. Um, Another thing we wanted to do, yeah. No, that's not what killed Demos at Los Alamos. Okay, the question was, wasn't message passing risky because uh, at that time because didn't Demos have message passing and wasn't that what killed Demos at Los Alamos? No, what killed Demos at Los Alamos. Uh, was they had a hard time, first of all, getting the thing to work. Uh, and second of all, they were e much more conservative uh, at, at Los Alamos, the whole environment, in terms of the user community and so on. Uh, and, uh, uh, be and we at Livermore had, at that time, had, had LTSS running, and it was running very well. And there were lots of applications running on it, uh, et cetera. And we were struggling to get NLTSS coming along and the user community at Los Alamos just said, look, you know, we don't want to keep supporting this new stuff that doesn't seem to ever quite make it. And so, you know, they shot it. Uh, uh, and, and Demos had a lot of good stuff in it. I mean, uh, there was a lot of very interesting ideas in Demos, and I don't want to go into all that. But, but it died basically because the user community, the customers, you know, shot it. OK, so coming back, so another thing we wanted to do was we wanted to separate the human-oriented kind of naming in the environment from the machine-oriented naming of objects. Uh, there were a number of reasons having to do with transparency, being able to move things around. And so we settled on, on object identifiers that Jed's going to talk a little more about, 256-bit. These were capabilities. They were encrypted. And if you had one of these things, you had the right to get at the object. Okay. Uh, so this was capability operating system in a, in a, in a very pure sense. And then, given, that, given these things, then you could build naming services and put human-oriented naming on top of all that. Um, and then again, I mentioned the capabilities. Separation of data and control was an important idea uh, that, that we wanted to have. And, and one of the reasons we wanted that was that in a high-performance environment, we wanted to be able to have, say, the control be on, on machine A, but the data to go from B to C without having to go up to A and then down to C. Okay. 
So we really wanted to be able to move it directly through the network at high speed. And we've continued that idea in this high performance storage system, uh, which is still kicking, um, in which the servers are over here that manage the hierarchical storage system, but all the devices are network attached <coughs> disks or tape, and they move the data directly uh, to the client machines uh, under the control of, of the servers. Uh, uh, you know, which send the control messages uh, either directly, you know, through this network, depending on the nature of its technology, or through a, a, an, an Ethernet. But if this is HIPI or, or a fiber channel or something, then the data is flowing directly. So that was a key idea that we had. We wanted to improve the performance by not having to do the actual copy into memory and out of memory uh, that we were one of the things we were trying to achieve. Um, and then we wanted to have a uh, a, uh, an IPC model that would support you know, both efficient transactions as well as, 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 as efficient and high speed, high throughput streams. Okay. So at the, you know, now these, uh, these ideas you know, don't seem very radical, but back in 78, they were fairly radical, particularly to think of trying to do this on a supercomputer. Uh, especially on a Cray that had no memory management. And Jed will talk a little bit about some of the, the handstands and things that we had to do to make, make that reasonably efficient. So the, uh, the model of, of this NLTSS operating system for the Cray then was basically that it, uh, uh, this is the distributed model, but think of this on a Cray. And basically in the kernel, you've got interprocess communication, you've got your device drivers, low-level device multiplexing, and then everything else is a server that's logically in user space. Uh, and then, of course, you've got your client applications. And one of the interesting things about NLTSS was the only operating system call was to send or receive a message. Uh, <coughs> there weren't any other, other, other calls in, in, in the operating system. Now, what we actually did in terms of the implementation was we actually had to implement some of the servers, even though logically their, app, their application user actually resided uh, in the kernel, so we could do some tricks to actually get some very fast message passing. Yes? I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm still not with you. A asynchronous messages? Yes. Uh, we'll let Jed talk about that when he gets up here. Okay, so um, so we we actually uh, built this thing uh, on the craze, and Jed's going to talk a, a more detail about you know all the issues that that came up when we actually had to put this on on the Cray machines. We built instantiations of pieces of it to handle all the archival storage. We had a, a protocol called Delta T, which is a timer-based protocol, did not require three-way handshakes, so we could have uh, uh, minimize the number of messages in the, in the, at the transport level, et cetera. And basically, uh, we got, we <coughs> about 1984, it, it was really clear that Unix was gaining speed. Okay, so we started this, this work uh, around, uh, I don't know, 79, implementing it. I don't know, Bob, you were one of the first project leaders. What was that, about 7980, something like that? Um, and, <coughs> and by 84, it was really clear uh, to, to, to quite a few of us that Unix you know, was, was on its way. And, and, uh, and so the only way that this was going to survive was that we, ha we were going to have to put a Unix shell on top of the, the whole thing. Okay. Um, and uh, so we went to the user community and said, you know, Unix is coming. Uh, uh, you know, you can either get ready to, to, to go to that or you could support us putting a Unix shell on. And the user community basically said, no way. Uh, they wanted to put an emulation on top of this NLTSS to emulate LTSS so they could continue to run all their old programs. <coughs> so in 84, basically, our fate was sealed because we were told to continue our current path, which was to emulate LTSS on top of this nice microkernel message passing 
uh, kind of environment. And, uh, and then uh, around 88, uh, Gorbachev uh, uh, took down the wall in Berlin. Uh, in 76, when I arrived at the lab, the Livermore Computing Center had 238 people. Uh, a large number of these people were writing compilers, operating systems, doing all the networking stuff. And between 88 and 90, it dropped from 200, you know, it, it had gone down some along the way, but it was like, a, by, by, by around 90, it was like 120 or something like that. So it, you know, suddenly there was just nobody left to maintain any homebrew anything. And so the decision was made, you know, let's go to off the shelf stuff. And so we closed down NLTSS, uh, I think it was 91, something like that, uh, and switched over to Unicos. Uh, and so it's been it's been uh, Unix all the way since then, uh, and uh, <coughs> the only the only system software we're currently actually building is this high performance storage system, which still has some of the remnants of the architecture that I was sort of outlining here, uh, and uh, so that's uh, and it kind of surprised me actually that we lived that long. Uh, I mean, we we really had a good a, a really I mean it was a lot of fun. Uh, it's not too often uh, in somebody's career that you get to build a whole distributed architecture, think, think it all through from, from bottom to top, and implement a hell of a lot of stuff. Um, that's just too bad. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking very uh, sort of selfishly from, from the point of view of all of us that were involved in it, that we actually never were able to bring it full to full uh, fruition. It was, it was an interesting thing, and, we, and there were a lot, of, uh, a lot of really good ideas in what we did. Okay, so let me turn it over to John Fletcher. Uh, yeah, Hi. Eugene. Yeah. How, how, how it looked how it looked like from the outside yeah. Yeah. right right the rest is history right yeah Gordon Well, I, you know, and and I think it, you know that was the right, yeah, yeah. So I, you know, this is just to repeat in the microphone here. This is Gordon Bell talking about when he went to head up computing at NSF. Uh, the LTSS or CTSS was running at 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 the two NSF supercomputer centers at Illinois and San Diego. Um, and uh, uh, he pulled the plug on them to get them to go uh, to Unix uh, to get to the vendor-supported environment. So they, you know, and I think, you know, in hindsight, that was all the right, right decision. I can't, I can't, uh, I can't I complain about that. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, it is sad to realize that we d we still got stuck in the in the in the, uh, you know, in the third generation. And I don't think we'll, you know, at least in my lifetime, we'll never get beyond it. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, Unix is about to die. Uh, uh, with NT rolling over it in the same way that, you know, Unix rolled over everybody else, and and, and that's karma, uh, and uh, uh, and that's even sadder. Uh, but that's just a, a personal view. Yeah.
No, no, it's not till we got Max. Uh, <laughs> now, actually, we had a we had a somewhat of a Judge going to show you a, a view graph. We had a somewhat of a graphical <laughs> user interface. We had a thing called TMDS, which was a terminal monitor display system, uh, which which had bitmap displays and so on, and uh, and that lived on. You know, you know. I mean, users gave that up at the very end. I mean, that was a very hard thing to give up. Uh, Yeah, we had a few, uh, yeah. but it really wasn't. Uh, so George, George uh, uh, has always felt that uh, uh, DOE should have continued uh, in the in, in the line of doing its own 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 thing, uh, and uh, he was a lone voice uh, crying in the wilderness. Uh, but it was a uh, uh, you know we 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 hung in there as long as we could. <laughs> Okay, John, you're going to tell us a little bit about early networking. That's the tools of the trade here. Huh? I got this. I think I'm probably the only person in the room wearing a tie, but my wife is present. I didn't get away without <laughs> that. <laughs> Um, well, I think before I start, uh, I'd like to respond to his his question. Actually, we did do some work at putting uh, our uh, Lynx protocols over Unix. Uh, that's what we did on the small computers in the network, uh, like workstations. Uh, and I think that could have survived, but the management at that time, was, at the time they were shifting to Unix, uh, well, I think did a terrible job. In fact, they essentially made villains out of anybody who'd worked on the system that uh, we developed and, uh, and you know, gave more points to the people who'd been the least help, I thought. And they just wanted it all out. Uh, and the curious thing uh, Dick mentioned, the, uh, this uh, HPSS project, there was something that preceded that. And uh, a code that I had written that did put links over uh, essentially uh, Unix and, uh, and the uh, ARPA protocols got into that. And just as it was getting into that came this word that you can't work on that stuff anymore. And also, just at that moment, it was clear that that code had you know, kind of grown like Topsy and was due for a complete rewrite. So I couldn't completely rewrite it, but I had to make it work with this new storage system. And that became a terrible piece of code. I mean, debugging it with the people who were trying to push it to its limits it was a long, arduous job. And I think it still exists today, this, this awful patched and repatched code, just because management had decided don't do it right. But it was all right to waste time patching it. Okay. You are retired. Yes. <laughs> and so is that management. So is management. <laughs> yes. Uh, they didn't last very long either. They were just a little older than I was. There's a story about the retirement systems, and I'm in the good one that gave us a good deal, and they were in the bad one that didn't. So, uh, so there was some justice in my well, I'm the, uh, the oldest of this crowd. As he says, I'm retired. I've been retired for about four years. So if I suddenly uh, stop and, uh, and sit down, it's because I've forgotten everything. <laughs> I, uh, I hope I remember some of it. <laughs> uh, no, I... I know there were, I mean, we had codes like that, but in this shift to Unix, they went away. But, uh, you know, I've thought about it. I, uh, toward the end of my career, when I was just filling in with, on things, I actually wrote a calendar code to take the, the Unix seconds since 1970 count and convert it to a calendar date and back again. And when I was doing that, I asked myself, should I take care of the fact 
that it's, uh, even though 2000 is a leap year, 2100 won't be. Do the leap year thing right. And then I realized that at least on 32-bit machines, which is what we had, the Unix calendar runs out at about 2038 and wraps around to around 1904. So uh, I'm wondering how many people are thinking about that one. Uh, remember, you heard it here first. Uh, so you say what? Hopefully the world will end first. Oh, hopefully the world will end first. <laughs> or at least we'll all get to 64-bit machines. Or something. So anyway, uh, well, as I say, I'm the, the oldest here. Uh, I came to the lab as a physicist. I had uh, done my uh, doctoral dissertation in general relativity, and uh, of course, uh, there wasn't much uh, practical demand for that at a place like the lab. So uh, I went into uh, more mundane physics. And I found after a while that I was more interested in the computer programs themselves than in the physical answers they gave. And it happened that the uh, head guy at the, at the uh, department of the physics department I was in, so-called theoretical division, was also the head of computation. He had two hats. And so it was very easy for me to sneak over under his other hat and start working on computers. And uh, so that's how I entered the game in around 1965 or so. And at that time, this octopus network thing was just starting. Uh, uh, Norm Hardy, I think, had been instrumental in it. But the idea of octopus is what the name suggests. Actually, I'm more of a blackboard type. What do I do to get the screen up on my window? Now that I know I'm OK. But what they'd purchased is a PDP-6, actually two of them, the idea that one of them was a spare. So when this thing failed, the other one could be shifted in. Uh, is green a bad color? OK, so the PDP-6. And what we're going to be attached to it were things like, at that time, 6600s, uh, which we came to call worker computers, because they presumably did the real work that we wanted done. And then there would be things like terminals. And originally, the PDP-6 had a giant multiplexer on it. Well, not so giant, probably, by today's standards. But anyway, big enough for us uh, that would multiplex many terminals with this machine doing the uh, you know, the software work. And then other things like storage and, uh, well, I.O., which is mainly O, is the, the big problem. And, uh, well, you name it. So you see where the name octopus came from. Here's the head. Here are the tentacles reaching out to all kinds of things. And uh, so that was the model. Well, it, well, it didn't take long. I mean, it's think back, you know, why hadn't people known this before they got started in this crazy direction, uh, is that that doesn't work very well. Because if the head goes down, everything goes down, pretty much. Uh, you can switch in another PDP-6, but that, you know, that's a big glitch. Uh, and furthermore, everything you want to do, every new thing you want to do, requires a change in this machine. So it's in a continual state of debug, so it goes down a lot. So uh, no, that just doesn't work. So our second model uh, was, I think we had a picture here like this, uh, with uh, the workers up here. And then down here were machines that did things like I.O. or storage or terminals. And then they were wired to these machines in one way or another. And uh, this was called the multiple subnetwork model. Uh, Dick didn't know the name. I think that's the name. Uh, that is, each of these machines is its own, a head of its own little subnetwork that's attached to the workers and to whatever else it needs to be attached to, depending on its job. Obviously, these guys are attached to terminals. These guys are attached to storage devices. Uh, well, as that was going on, uh, as far as I know, we independently invented packet switching. 
it, uh, it became clear that if you're sending messages between these machines, they're little blocks of stuff. Uh, I think we called them messages at first and later learned there was this other word, packet, that was more accurate for what we were doing. That you should have something on the packet, a heading or header, that told where it was going and where it was coming from and, and so on. And so we started doing that. And then, of course, the idea developed that, well, uh, you don't need a wire, say, uh, between all pairs of machines. You can put in another terminal uh, computer out here, and you could, say, wire it to the other two and not to any of the worker computers. And it would still work because these store and forward packets could, you know, do it in multiple hops. And so at least some of us at some point, uh, probably at least by 1970, realized that the connections of the network really didn't matter, unless, you know, in, in some abstract sense. I mean, you need them, some that are fast and some that are slow and that kind of thing. But it really didn't matter. The important thing was, was the logic of the software. And, but even today, I think a couple of the slides that Dick put up show people thinking mainly about actually where the wires run. All these things, one of these pictures showed two high-speed switches. The important thing is how they're wired together, you know, but the, the important thing is the logic of it. So that's what we did. So that's, uh, that's kind of the development. I think since I'm talking historically, I should talk about uh, also some of the really interesting pieces of hardware we had in those early days. Uh, as Dick indicated, we stole from the Multics people shamelessly. Uh, in fact, we actually did some of the things that they said they were going to do, but actually didn't quite do. Uh, well, we can mention those. But one thing that Multics said you should do, and which we took seriously, turned out not to really work out, was this idea of having a very complex virtual memory system uh, in a computer. And namely, we put it in this one. If you remember the Multics thing with its pages and its segments and uh, sorted base registers and so on. One of our engineers actually did that to the PDP-6. And we had uh, that kind of uh, complex virtual memory system, which is more complex than the ones that, you know, we have today that are, you know, adequately complex. This, I think, was over adequately, but we did do it. Uh, and, and, of course, it was an enormous step up from the uh, CDC machine which were just, you know, a location, relo single relocation address and a field link, and that kind of uh, a virtual memory. Uh, I remember one time in my life, just one time, uh, I was at Chippewa Falls on some kind of junket that we had, and I ended up at lunch straight across the table from Seymour Cray. And so I thought, well, this is my chance. And I tried to make the pitch to him that you should at least have two relocation registers so you could separate the data from the program and make one you know, read only, and execute only or something. And he said, uh, no, that would be uh, s slow it down. And uh, of course, I was young and foolish. I thought I would argue with Seymour Cray. And I, <laughs> uh, I proceeded to describe exactly how you could do it without costing you any time, where you would do both relocations at once, and then at the last possible moment, you would pick the right one. And he says, ah, one more gate. It would slow it down. So for <laughs> one gate time, Seymour Cray would not put a double relocation in his machine. And of course, he was right. It would slow it down. Uh, so uh, anyway, that was one thing we did that didn't work out. But there were other pieces of interesting equipment uh, that should be mentioned. The radiation incorporated printer uh, was, I think, briefly mentioned. I think Jed has a picture of it here somewhere. <coughs> you might uh, see. I can't tell whether that's uh, turned over or upside down. But, uh, I mean, right. left or right, doesn't matter. But this, uh, I believe, is from the 60s, uh, or very early 70s. But it's a 30,000 line per minute, the line being 120 characters across, printer. Uh, when it finally had to be junked, there was only ever one of it built, uh, it was replaced by two 18,000 line a minute printers. In the time that this thing, its entire lifetime, nothing its equal was built. 
but here you can see the giant roll of paper that, that fed the thing. It had to be giant because this stuff was moving like crazy and you didn't want to have the thing down very long for people to reload that thing. So you try to reduce the amount of time. Uh, and here you can see it coming out the other end and it's being fan folded by a bunch of little arms that go whack, 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 whack real fast. I mean, it's crazy to watch this thing uh, do its thing. Uh, whatever 30,000 lines a minute comes out to be. And the operators, of course, had to prevent this thing from running off the end. So they would come and, and kind of leaf through this fan folded pile to find the space between two jobs. And then they rip it apart and take this great thing in it, and it would have more room to grow again. Uh, the paper was a double layer stuff. It was a black layer and a gray layer. And, and it smelled terrible. Uh, some people actually claimed that they became ill from, from inhaling the fumes. And I, I wonder today you know, what their medical properties were. <laughs> yeah. I inhaled it too, so. Uh, yeah. But uh, in the actual guts of the machine that was doing the printing were a sufficient number of little fine needles to be 120 characters worth of raster uh, across the thing. And these drew sparks as the paper passed under them and burned the gray layer off the black. So what you had were black characters on a gray background to look at. And I still have some of that paper uh, that I saved. And of course, someday I'll be rich when they, they start collecting this kind of stuff. <laughs> well, so anyway, that was one, uh, one piece of equipment. We don't have a picture of another piece of uh, equipment that was really uh, wonderful. Uh, at least we don't have it here. Uh, but I'd like to mention, and that's the IBM Photo Digital Store, which was a trillion-bit store that at that time was, was really amazing. This is, uh, again, the late 60s, early 70s it showed up. And... Um, what it, uh, well, how do you describe it? The thing was about 10 feet long, I think, but had R wings that came out of it. So the greatest width was probably like eight feet. And the, some of the wings were for storage. One of the wings was for the recording process. And actually, I think it was only a little tiny wing that was needed for the reading process. But uh, the way the thing worked is that you had this thing. I brought one of them. Judd reminded me I should do that. But this is called a cell. There were several thousand of them in the machine and a way to take them out of the machine and store them on a shelf. So there was a system of taking them out. And inside the cell are these things. This is photographic film. They were called chips. Now, of course, this one has never been recorded upon. If it had been recorded upon, what you would see is 32 little gray squares on here. Four by eight. Uh, it's uh, also um, people would no doubt come and arrest me because everything that was recorded was classified by definition. So none of us have been able to walk away with one of those that actually was recorded on. Well, I'll spend the rest of the day getting it back. In. They are. <laughs> Maybe they were recorded somewhere else, we hope, or? There were, there were several, there were three of them in the world. That was the NSA. Yeah, NSA had some. Yeah. See, I, I, I mean, I hear these stories. Uh, you know, I don't want you guys to obviously take the stories or anything, but like, uh, you guys you commissioned a disc. It's supposed to run these scrubbers. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, it's supposed to run these Write random discs a uh, hundred times. It's impossible yeah. to be old. Yeah, that's things like that were claimed. Now, were, were those, was that determined seriously by you guys? Did somebody else? Uh, I never knew who came up with those numbers. I, uh, Sid Fernbach once quoted to me a study of, of picking a sine wave off a disk, uh, but after it had been worked on many times. But that seems believable because I mean the sine wave had nothing to do with the 
the density. I mean, it was a very low frequency thing going around to this. Uh, yeah, so I don't know if anybody really tried to get things off. But I think for the most part, they were supposed to really destroy the disks, ultimately. Uh, had to do with a, uh, a <coughs> physicist, you said, uh, acting as a programmer who uh, was learning to write Fortran, and he put his statement numbers all beginning with a one for some reason, some fetish of his. And the nature of the uh, control of the printer was that it would page eject on every one. So he got one line per page. I guess that implies that he also put a statement label on every line, whether he needed it or not. Good. I used to do things like that, too, when I first started. I, I didn't put a statement label every line, but I left. I, I would count the lines, you know, statement number 18, then one, two, three, four unlabeled lines. Next one's 23. And, but then I, I learned you didn't need to do that. <laughs> yeah, so. Well, anyway, this, uh, this IBM photo store was an amazing thing. When we first, uh, the first time I saw it and several other people saw it was at a, a uh, IBM facility in San Jose where they were building it. And uh, I think everybody came away with the impression it could never work. I mean, it, it, it was like those old Rube Goldberg cartoons. It really was. Uh, you started out with uh, 10 of these and something that looked like a cigarette carton wrapped in black paper. There's a little hatch on the machine. You lifted it up. You shoved the carton in, and knives inside would rip the carton open and spill the, these little cells into the interior of the machine. Then you could pull the thing back out and close it, and they never saw the light of day. One by one, these cells were then taken to a place where the top was removed. The little finger would have to push this hole at the top, pull the lid aside, take the chips out one by one, and it would be held in front of an electron gun that would write on them with an electron beam. The thing had sensors of the beam, so it could focus itself automatically uh, as it was going. It uh, had, uh, I think it was 32 filaments, or was it 16? Some number like that on a turret and it would periodically change its own filament by rotating the turret, so you didn't have to do that too often. After the thing had been written on uh, with, uh, does everybody know the word booster pedonic? Which means that alternately with the lines go one way and then the other, back and forth. And uh, the lines had, uh, well, there were, the it depends on how you looked at it. It's you know, the field uh, uh, image problem, but, uh, there were interlaced white and black lines with interlaced white and black bumps on them. That's why every cell looked uniformly gray. But under a microscope, you could, uh, could see the encoding. Uh, so anyway, after the thing got written on, then the little chip was taken and was put in a little beaker that was on a kind of a carousel. And the successive photochemicals would be added. One thing would be added in one place and drained out, and the thing would rotate more chemical, and finally wash water is coming in. The last few stations, dry air was blowing. And after about uh, two to three minutes, these pieces of film now fully developed, ordinary silver halide film, uh, would be put in another one of these cells waiting at the other end. Uh, to get the machine started, you have to put one empty cell in it to be at the other end. Because then after a new cell with raw film in it was, was emptied, it would move around to the other end to await the next cell's uh, output. These things were then blown through pneumatic tubes to be stored in things that kind of looked like egg crates, except it's for rectangular eggs, obviously. And, uh, uh, and then it would be blown back out of the egg crates through the pneumatic tubes to a flying spot optical scanner, which could read the stuff. Uh, all the writing was done with an error correcting code. And so the flying spot scanner also had access to the same error correcting code. And as many, if they were properly placed, as many as 10% of the bits on a chip could be wrong, and you could still reconstitute what it was supposed to say. And uh, it was a trillion bits. You take, I think, you know, you, you all, I mean, I don't know all the numbers anymore, but if you. As this is the equivalent of an 8 PPI tape. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, 
I can't remember anymore. Something like that, though. Yeah, I mean, of course, obviously, redundancy bits were fewer than the other. Anyway. But yeah, it, uh, and it, and it really worked. There was an IBM engineer whose job ended up being that machine. He, he was on site. His job was to keep that machine running. And when the machine left, he retired. <laughs> uh, IBM offered him a deal, and, and away he went. Uh, what, what, what year was it retired? Uh, 79, I think we just saw a figure that suggested that, or thereabouts. <clears throat> yeah, that was interesting. When it was time for it to go, uh, you know, uh, well, IBM told us, I mean, they were very good about this. I mean, they said, on a certain date, we will no longer be able to make spare parts for it, because they're all unique. I mean, who else uses stuff like this? Uh, and then they say, on a certain later date, we'll stop maintaining it. So, oh, this is a crisis coming. Uh, so a committee at the lab studies it. Should we do something to engage some other person to manufacture, some other company to manufacture what we need, uh, someone else to maintain it? Committee says no. The answer comes back. People look at it and say, we better appoint another committee. There must have been about four or five committees that every time this answer worked its way a little more forward, they're sure, no, no, we've got to do something else. But finally, it did go away. Uh, and and this, this engineer, his name is Jim Dimmick, that worked for IBM, he, he was just amazing that he could take care of that thing. And the story I want to tell is the day that I came down uh, downstairs. Well, in those days, you didn't have a terminal in your office. There weren't that many. The terminals were in special rooms. And for us in the systems programming, that room was the computer floor. You came down there, and you sat at the terminal and did your thing. And, and the terminal was a Model 33 Telus type. I think Jed even has a picture of that for those of you who might not have seen it. Uh, and anyway, I looked over at Jim Dimmick, who was seated by his thing, and I thought to myself, my first impression was, he's flipped his lid. Because I swear to God, he was cutting out paper dolls. And uh, you know, he had the folded white paper, and he was working on it with the scissors. And I came over, and I asked, well, what are you doing? And I thought, you know, I'm afraid of what the answer is. And the answer is that the machine wasn't quite working right. Some things were binding. And these were shims. He was going to build up some part you know, and clamp it back together. And sure enough, it was working. And, uh, and so the paper dolls worked. So anyway, that, uh, so that's the, uh, the photo store history. There were you know, lots of other things. Uh, there was, uh, in fact, our first three storage devices of this Octopus network, uh, which I guess now I can Flip the screen, maybe back up. Uh, the uh, first three storage devices, one was the photo store that came last. The one that came first was a thing called a data cell, which was a thing that used um, uh, tape as a medium, a peculiar kind of tape. But it was also highly mechanical, uh, with lots of things going on, and also, of course, relatively slow of access. And the other thing which came second was uh, a Libroscope head per track disk, which I forget what the capacity is. I think it was just a little less than, uh, than uh, let me see now, you, which you people, most of you would call a gigabit, right? Yes. yes. I call it a gigabit because uh, I read the, how to say the word long before it became popular. And all the old dictionaries say it's with a soft G. But anyway, uh, you know, it was big for its time, and it was fast because it had a head per track, so there was no time for moving the head back and forth. These platters were at least six feet in diameter, enormous things, and they were spun on a horizontal axle uh, inside the, uh, a case. But it was clear that the steel covering of that case would be no match for those big things if anything got loose. And I always had this image of the axle slipping off its bearings and this giant rolling thing just going across the room. Does someone have a story that had happened? No. No, although I have a strategy back. I don't know. Like, question was, you know, anything, Oh, yes. See, that's... Essentially everything. Essentially everything. 
three years, if I remember, the archive. Yeah, the, uh, and I think it was on to that, uh, was that CDC, those little yellow cylinders with the tapes in them? Yeah, but, and, and meanwhile, it had to be working. And you've got to remember, it wasn't just a trillion bits. I think it was like seven trillion. There was six trillion were on, on shelves, having been lifted out of the machine. So the, there was a whole program system written just to do this. Tell the operators, bring these trays, set them in the machine, and they would be read and into the PDP-6, or it was a PDP-10 by that time, and then sent to the new medium, then read off the new medium and compared to make sure it was all right. And as he said, it took years. But uh, the physicists would never, and you, and you can understand why, they could never identify what they didn't want. You never know what, what, piece, what, old, ex, what old run, what old calculation is suddenly important. Only four? Yeah. It looked big. We discovered that it, the ideal size and shape for coffee table drops and bars off for that purpose. I have one in the living room. Oh, okay. I guess it must be that the, you know, the, the container maybe was larger. Yeah. There's, there's some airspace around the edges. I'm out of time already? All I've done is reminisce. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when you retire. <laughs> Well, okay, uh, let me just say that uh, we built up uh, from, from this, and at the time Dick arrived, uh, we, uh, as I say, we'd already invented packet switching, uh, probably again, and uh, we're, I guess, already ran LTSS. Oh. Well, the next uh, speaker is uh, Jed Donnelly. He came when, Jed? 72. Okay, so uh, he, uh, he can tell you what happened next. Okay, um, so I've got little bits and pieces, some additional hardware and some software. In the historical influences, people were talking about some of the early PDP-1 systems. I worked in this uh, group called Resos. It was an operating system security group, and I was a hacker coming out of college. You know, I uh, I worked on a Burroughs system, which was uh, architecturally unsecurable because they used the language to protect the system. And in fact, I think the same mistake is being made with the Java sandbox nowadays, but, uh, but that's another story. Um, and I came to Livermore, and it was this fantastic environment that, where they were going to pay me to break into operating systems. <laughs> ARPA had this project, they were called Tiger Teams back then, where you'd go around the ARPA network, you know, breaking into different operating systems. So we were an early node on the ARPA network, and one of the sort of influences on this group, a guy named Charlie Landau, I, I don't know if he showed up for this, but uh, anyway, he came from MIT where they were working on the, um, uh, that early PDP-1 system at MIT, which was a capability-based system. That is, it had this idea of, of pointers to resources like files and directories and processes and things like that. And you could pass these between processes. And one of the one of the early things that happened with the ARPANET influence, I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could pass rights uh, to things like this across the network? And in fact, I would still like to do that. I think it's a major flaw <laughs> in the internet that I can't take something that I have, like a directory or a file, and put it in an email message and send it to you and have you be able to pick it up. I mean, all the encryption technology is available to do that, and, and nobody has done it. Um, but anyway, that, that basic idea, you know, we, we did an operating system. It was on a PDP-11 back then. Um, it was a capability-based system. And I designed this uh, mechanism that was later used by the mock system, where essentially you'd have, you have 
resources like files or directories on one system, you'd put a server on it, somebody could send it a message and say, I want to use that one. You'd invoke whatever it was, send the results back, and it would go back through the network. Um, and I took that, you know, got together with John and Dick when we were saying, hey, it's time to new, do a new operating system. And that was kind of the thing that I was pushing. And we had this great debate that John ultimately won, where he said, no, you don't want to have real descriptors on the machine. Since everything is going to be a network, these writes just have to be bits that you send across the network. And ultimately, that was the design of the system. And when actually it turned out that it, it was a very poor design at the time because public key encryption hadn't been invented. And fortunately, it came along. Unfortunately, it was too slow. <laughs> and uh, now it would be a great, a great way of doing things like that. But uh, one, I guess one anecdote I'll mention about the resource work. Um, we had, in addition to being on the ARPA network, we also had a bunch of telephones, because a lot of computers weren't on the networks back then, unlike today. And so we'd have to dial out. We had an outward going Watts line you know, that's free to make calls and so forth. And one of the things we're also doing is analyzing uh, these operating systems. And I had developed this technique of sort of testing systems, of driving them through all the conditional exits from their, uh, from their conditional statements, and then developing um, you know, test codes for doing that. And one day, this guy came into me, and he said, look at this simple instruction, this simple system call. All it does is you pass it a bunch of flags. It does a, an exclusive or with uh, some system registers. It checks to see whether the result is zero, and it returns plus one if not, and, and it returns the next statement if it is. What could possibly be wrong with that? And I started looking at that and said, oh, no, we've got to test it, you know, go through all this, this thing. And I, lo and behold, I discovered that there was a flaw in this thing, that if you'd execute this instruction at the very last word in virtual memory, then you could get it to to add in a register field and then execute that, and you could go off and take over the system from that. So, you know, I discovered this, and I thought, well, I better check to make sure this actually works. And so I started working on a little assembly language program that would test it. And of course, there was a bug in it, and it immediately crashed the system. This is a 10x system. I don't know if people know that. This is around 1975, something like that. And uh, so then a big brouhaha happened because I'd crashed the system. And I was going off on a trip to the East Coast. And I thought I needed to stay in touch with the network. Well, back then you had TIPS, you know, terminal imps that uh, were your only way of accessing the network. And there were just a few of them scattered around the country. So you couldn't be local calls, you know, like you are now with ISPs. So I thought, well, what I can do is I can write a program from our outward going watts that will call me. And so I could take my terminal with me, and I could set up ahead of time to call me at a certain time in a certain place. And then I'd be able to receive this call. Back then, you had to carry these big silent 700s along with you. So I'd take that to my aunt's place in Florida and some place in Washington, D.C., and it would call me. And I'd be waiting you know, at a certain time. And then I'd connect up, and then I could read my email and send email and say, oh, no, I was really supposed to break into that system. That's my job. And so I wrote this program, and I was leaving. It was one of those last-minute things. And I finished about 4 o'clock in the morning, got in this program, and I was going windsurfing the next day. That was also the very early days of windsurfing. I had like serial one windsurfing. <laughs> 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 so I set up this program. I thought, well, this is great. You know, 4 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to bed. I'll have it call me and wake me up. Wake me up at, you know, 9 o'clock in the morning. So sure enough, 9 o'clock in the morning, the phone rings in my apartment. I pick it up. Nothing there. It's the computer. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't whistle at you if it calls you. So I thought, oh, yeah, it's the computer. Clunk started to go back to sleep. Well, the phone rings again. I thought, pick it up. Wait a minute. It shouldn't happen. You know. Well, it turned out I, I, I popped when I should have, or I pushed when I should have popped. And this thing was in an infinite loop calling me on the phone. <laughs> well, so my phone was essentially out of order. <laughs> I had to leave it off for about three hours before the 4K byte uh, segment on the PDP-11 overflowed and it finally got a, got a fall. But it turned out that that program did work. My aunt was amazed when I came to Florida with this big terminal. And I sat there and I said, 9 o'clock, it's going to call me. And sure enough, the phone rings and I set this thing up. And uh, anyway, so that was some of the things we got into with, uh, with those systems. One thing that somebody asked about that I thought I'd pick up on just a little bit is the, uh, the bitmap display. Um, we had this system. In fact, why don't I 
don't know if there's time to get some of these. I can circulate this around if people want to look at this. That's some old thermal paper from this thing called the television monitor display system. And it was a, a data disk system that I think this must have been an early configuration. I think later there were more lines or something. But basically it was just a disk that had, you know, what was it, 256 by 256 or 512, that's right, 512 by 512, just a bitmap display. And if you got three of these planes, then you could have color uh, on these things. And an example of a display, uh, which is relevant to the period, it, That looks right to me. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so this is an example uh, that, in fact, I think it's the one that's going around. Uh, you can see the bits. In fact, there's one interesting part of this. Where is it? Right here, where you can see that the data disk was coming through. You know, this, this part here doesn't actually, where's the pointer? Um, this part here actually doesn't line up. The left-hand part and the right-hand part are, you know, it's sort of flowing through when it took the particular snapshot that it showed on the screen. But you can get a, a little bit of a flavor for the environment on the computers. These were uh, four Cray machines, actually, at this time. This was after the 7600s. But the operating system, the pictures, you know, basically everything stayed the same. You see, uh, you know, big jobs. These are percentage of memory. And so it was very important to, you know, get these jobs. Uh, I mean, if, if you could only fit, like, one or two production jobs in the machine, then, you know, they had to be optimized to keep the machine busy. If you look over here, you've got, this is the idle time, and it was very important to keep that down at zero. And the system time, um, you know, I don't know what was going on here, but typically 3%, they adjusted this thing called the K factor. And the K factor meant sort of how long a job sat in memory before it had to come out and some other job come in where you, you uh, spent a lot of system time. So on the s systems that were timeshare, the K factor would typically be low, 8 or 16. And the system time correspondingly high, six percent, or and on the yeah, well that that happens sometime when some you know file transfer, some some big system job was going on, uh, and but typically the the codes were were very efficient, and you just sit see them sit in there and just chew up cycles like crazy, yeah. and these codes would run for many days, and they'd have to be checkpointed and. I mean, that's kind of the environment that was, uh, was I asked about that. Actually, Dick had it reviewed. The, apparently, the names are not uh, not classified anymore. I mean, the names of the codes. Yeah. You, you yeah. can. As long as we don't talk to you about what they do. Yeah, then we'd have to shoot you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I sort of know what some of them do. Okay. Um, well, you know. One of the interesting things, I mean, Dick was mentioning these different generations of, of systems. And uh, let's see. Well, maybe I should stick with the historical thread for just a second here. There's a couple of other. Here's one chart that it relates to the, the storage stuff that I thought was a pretty good one. I don't, maybe, I guess, for this light, it is too bad. But uh, th this is uh, IBM, you know, about to cut off the photo store here. And here's the, <laughs> here, here, here's the whole... <laughs> file transport system and then if you look in detail at this which I guess you can it tells you know how much storage is oh and I can also pass uh, some of these disks I think this might have been an 844 disk but when you look at these things you know you could use these to, to lift weights uh, yeah, a few megabytes <laughs> yeah right yeah. <laughs> One of the things that, that did disappoint me about this, Dick was talking about the different generations. Um, and I guess one thing he wanted me to pick up was this uh, sort of how we architected the message passing 
One of, the, one of the things about the NLTSS system that I haven't seen uh, since then is that internally it had an architecture that was very, I guess, very effective for multitasking, multiprocessing. As Dick mentioned, there was only one system call, and that system call basically said, here are a bunch of message transfers I want to do. I want to send this, send this, receive this, receive that. And I want you to wake me up when that one finishes, or that one finishes, or that one finishes. And so what you could have is a multi-threaded architecture where you've got all these threads you know, trying to do work until there's no work to do in a process. It could be you know, uh, as many processors as you want, but in a particular process. And at that point, it would issue its, its uh, messages and then just wait for anything to complete. Um, and then once it woke up, then, then a, a little um, lightweight uh, threading mechanism inside would, would look to see which one of these lightweight threads needed to run, and it would dispatch all those things and, and get them done. But the other thing about it that I would also um, like to see today, I think maybe Dick had a, had a chart or two on this, um, is this idea of a of a capability. And, you know, the closest thing today, I guess, is URLs, except that a URL points to a resource, but it doesn't encompass the rights to access that resource. I mean, and here's, here again is something that uh, all the technology exists today, the encryption technology, but I would, when we were working on these charts, for example, at least the one chart that we had there, I would dearly like to take my PowerPoint document and create the right to access it and give it to Dick, send it to him in an email. I couldn't do that. And, and one of the things we had in the Elephant system was we had the ability to create directories. Like, you know, instead of going to a sysadmin person and say, create a group in Unix or something like that, we could just create directories out of whole cloth and give people pointers to those directories. Because the pointer was just, you know, this network thing that pointed at it. And then I could give it to five or six people, and we'd have a little group. And people could put files in there. They could put other directories in. You could have some people would have write access, and some people would just have read access. And the thing that NLTSS did was make that happen across, you know, in general, a wide area network. And you know, that's something that you, know, you could do today with uh, the encryption technology, but it's just not there, and it's it's very frustrating to me. I don't know how people feel about that. I, I'm actually uh, working on a project to do something about that if anybody wants to, wants to work on it. I could, I could show uh, just a couple more things about the historical thing. This is kind of a transition picture. This is when we went from, this is sort of more detail when Hyperchannel came in. Um, we are now going to this, we had support systems <coughs> with its servers and, and this is our message passing model and this is actually a three-level network where we had a, a hyper channel as kind of the core, and then we had some uh, broadband networks, Ungerman Bass at that time, and then we had Ethernets down at the lowest level. Um, one of the other things about this message passing architecture, I don't know if you can, if you can see this in any detail, but this is a, an example of, one of what one of these messages looked like. They were all tokenized. And to get performance on this system, it was very important that we'd be able to send multiple functions in a single message. And so what you had was like little, you know, natural numbers that were op codes. This is actually part of a message, I think, that's starting up a process. And to start up a process, you had to send a message to the process server, and you had to send a message to the file, system, file server and tell the file server to send it the code. In fact, Norm <laughs> did, did a lot of this stuff to put all that stuff together and, and get that process uh, started. And this is just an example of some of the little, we call them tokens that were in the messages that, uh, that would allow that to get started. A little bit like uh, ASN1 syntax, but of course it was invented in Livermore. Um, I, think that's, I think that's about all I had to say. So anybody has any? Any questions? Maybe we could open it up for other questions. I, I had one other anecdote I guess I could share. It also involved um, telephones. Uh, during the early, maybe you can be thinking of questions while I tell this. Um, this was back in the blue box era. And one of the guys in the resource group um, 
was one of the guys that worked on that uh, roulette hardware for the pseudomonic pie. I don't know if people read that book, but uh, and he he was the guy that introduced me to system blackjack. You know, I didn't believe you could win at blackjack, and and in fact, this anecdote tells how I finally started believing this guy. I just thought this guy was full of baloney, and he had said that he designed uh, an integrated circuit for a blue box. Uh, uh, for those who don't know, a blue box is this device that would uh, send out the, the exact frequency codes to control the telephone tandems. You know, back in those years, you could control the telephone system by sending sounds down the line. You could make long distance calls for free and connect and disconnect. Anyway, that's a whole story. But anyway, I didn't believe this guy. And we went back to, uh, to Boston, actually, to work on the early ARPANET uh, at BBN. And we were back then, we had to make a call. We were at MIT looking around. We had to make this call to set up the meeting. And this guy gets on the phone, really a garrulous, you know, talk to anybody type guy. And he makes this call. And I'm sitting there watching him. And it, it's a wrong number. And so I'm, I'm saying, you know, come on, let's, let's get on with this. Get the right number. And he starts talking to the guy at the other end. And they keep talking and talking. I'm sitting there. And finally, I realize the guy at the other end is a phone freak. And so is this guy. And so you could see this thing happening where they're both telling each other secrets, you know, and getting each other to the point that they trust each other. And then finally, the guy invited us over to his place. And I'm thinking, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I could get arrested doing this. <laughs> but I tag along. I don't know why the guy trusted me. But we go into this, into this apartment, and there are just phones and blue boxes all over the place. It was like a three-level apartment. And they start bringing out these blue boxes and say, oh, yeah, old Bess, you had to hold her under your arm on a cold night, you know, to warm her up to, to, get the, to get the tones right. And then these guys, they made a call, and we called, like, the time of the day in Beirut. And we, <laughs> and we called the message of the, uh, the, uh, the song of the day in London. And then they spent the whole rest of the evening trying to make a call from, from Cambridge back to Kentucky, where one of the guys had a relative via Europe. <laughs> and Manasian had this special technique for doing it that turned out never to work. But, but when I, after I got back, then he trusted me a little bit more for some reason. He brought out the circuit diagram for this chip, for this blue box that was small enough that if you got caught, you could swallow it. <laughs> 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 And after that, I believed him, you know. And, and then I started saying, well, maybe you can win at blackjack. And it turned out he was right. I won at blackjack for many years. I mean, you can't win a lot, but, <laughs> but I'd always go up and take money off the casino. So anyway, why don't we just open it up? And if anybody has questions for. It does work. Okay. Should have said it before. You know, when we were talking about the radiation printer, uh, seven pages a second or ten pages a second, if you talk in terms of annual output, the radiation printer running about 30% of its capacity was producing something in the order of 36 to 40 million pages a year, which was distributed around the lab. It's a big machine because it had a big job to do. That's all. One of, my, one of my favorite anecdotes with the radiation printer was that if you take that folder off, off the uh, printer, the paper would shoot out 30 or 40 feet across the floor before it would hit the ground. I mean, it just came, <laughs> it just came out so fast out of that thing. Um, I, th I think those were actually for another system. We had a, what was the name of that high resolution graphic system back there? There was a, no, Gordo, no, that was yet another system. That was the Sig Sigma 7 system. The DD80, yeah, there was a, there was, yeah, DD80 or FR80. There was some graphic systems also downstairs. That tape might have been for the radiation printer, but I know there was. Yeah, I think it was. It, uh, the tape, in fact, moved at the same speed as the paper. Ah. Okay. <coughs> yes? Uh, I'd like to, I guess, a little more comment on the fourth generation and mock and parallel processing and why it's dead and, and will it ever be reborn and 
Uh, okay. Uh, so, so the question is about fourth generation systems and mock and um, you know, I, I have I have some hope in that area, and my hope is in this network computer thing, which ought to be near and dear to the heart of, of people at, at uh, Sun here, I guess. In that, um, you know, if you get to the point, of course, everybody knows the sysadmin stuff is just horrendous. I mean, I don't know how people, in many ways, is much worse today than it was back then. I mean. When people wrote software, they were at least there to maintain it. You, you have a bug or something breaks in your PC and you're helpless. I mean, you just turn it off and turn it back on again and hope the thing, uh, hope the thing comes up. Well, this, this network computer thing, if you can you know, just have uh, a station there that you just, you're on the network and you look out and you try software from the network and then it's supported, you know, like you get I don't know, maybe semantic Norton Utilities, you know, it asks you every once in a while, should I update myself? If that was all integrated, so you would download it the first time that way, and it would be maintained remotely, and if there was any bugs, they'd send dumps back to the, back to the maintainers. I think that the, the fundamental issue is, you know, as we all know, is an operating system is both a language and a set of resource management. You know, the API, the operating system is a language. And and once you get to the place where there's umpteen, you know, millions of lines of code out there, the economics are such that you can't, you can't move. And, and, and I think, you know, for example, take mock, okay? Uh, I mean, how much native mock is there in the world, right? I mean, uh, I mean, mock has a lot of really neat features, but mostly it just, it's, it's going to turn into Rhapsody or something. Uh, and then it'll die when Apple dies. Uh, uh, so it's it's the it's the it's the sheer momentum of the language that's going to be very difficult to get you know unless somebody can can figure out a strategy that makes you know you can you can do the underpinnings to get the ar architecture right and then somehow figure out how to evolve the language but without doing the language and the and the underlying architecture uh, I I think we're pretty stuck for a long time. No, I. Is on? Um, so <laughs> that's where I think the, you know, the Java model could come into play. I mean, if you have a different environment, and the big question is, is Office, you know, how is Office, how is the equivalent functionality of Microsoft Office going to run on this network computer? Uh, and if you can come up with some way of doing that and gradually take that over, then I think you've. Then I, then I think you've got a chance. Yes? Yeah, I'm, uh, I don't have a particular Java story. I'm actually my hope when I first saw Java and the idea of downloading applets was that somehow people would get used to the idea of renting software like they would rent a video as opposed to buying it, and that that would provide an economic incentive for the vendors to actually make software that would work for yeah, and then then they just want to. I don't know whether John is going to do it, but can you? Is, is that how we're going to go? That the economic has to turn first, and then that will lead you to. Well, yeah, that that can help. You know, uh, I mean, that would hopefully eliminate the incentive to just add new bells and whistles that get people to buy the next generation for the for the previous generation that doesn't have any bugs in it. Um, but I think Dick's right that the basic problem is the uh, the interface. You know, if people are if people keep writing to Win32, and then the thing's got to have Win32. You know, probably maybe the best hope is to have something like a network computer that supports a Win32 interface, and then you could have codes that would that would run in that environment, but still. Uh, networked, maybe maybe rented or maybe bought uh, from the vendors. That's Gordon. Gordon, how are we going to get the modern operating system? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. Okay. Now. Uh, 
so let, let's forget that, you know, when you say network computer, I don't think so. When you say network computer, a lot of people think of Larry Ellison's distless model, and I, I certainly... Well, yeah, I, I think the only thing that the network computer gets you away from is having some little guy come into your office and try to try to fix the thing there. Let me ask the question that I mentioned earlier on about access to resources. Um, you know, people are so worried about anonymous FTP servers, and if you have such a thing, how do you get things in? I mean, if you want to give something to somebody else, how do you do it? You, I mean, I've got, like, this PowerPoint document that we made the first chart on. I'd like to send it out in such a way that five or six of us can maintain it. We can read it and write it. How do you do that? And I'm saying we had a model. We had this capability <laughs> model where we could create a directory. We could pass it around to several people. We could then put something in the directory, the PowerPoint document, Excel thing, anything else you wanted. And anybody in that group, but not other people, could pull things out, work on it, write on it, anything they had access to. That model is eminently doable today. I'm sorry, what? Uh, I, I think my, the immediate thing that came up, because I'm currently going through hell on a not quite networked computer system, on, on the, you still have the issue of revision control. Sure. Yeah. I mean, once you've got access to the thing, you have to, you know, lock it or something, and you've got to, you know, update things. I'm talking about a lower level thing than that, just access control. I, I happen to be something that, somebody that passionately hates passwords. And in Livermore, many years ago, we basically had one password for the whole thing. I must have 30 of them encrypted in my watch now. I hate that. <laughs> and there's no reason for it anymore. I use SSH whenever I can. I use Kerberos whenever I can. I use PGP. I use SSL. Everything I can do, I would like on this network computer to have one private key. I'd like to be able to go out to 
things on the network and have it say, yes, I know who you are, you're Jed Donnelly, and give me the rights that Jed Donnelly has for whatever the resources are out there. Even that I can't do. But this capability model is even a finer level beyond that. It says that I can now create things like a directory into which I put other things, and I can give it to individual people, pointers, pointers to it, and they can give it to other people, and then we can generate a sharing environment. The way it works now with Unix, you know, people, you have to have an administrator set up a group or something, or, yes? If you want to give something to the whole world, the web is great. The web does that. If you want to give something to just a few individuals, the web doesn't do it. And if you want to control access in terms of writing or reading or that sort of thing, you just, just can't do it. Um, it seems to me that if the government were to quit fighting against people having secrets with encryption, that encryption technology would move a hell of a lot faster and we'd get somewhere with it. So you could share things new ways. Well, what does it matter if you encrypt something? If, if you don't have the capability to direct who gets it, what they do with it, I mean, if, uh, if John wants to give away, or Jen wants to give away uh, access to his particular file, the question is, does he, does he still have control of those files? Or does he have access to no in which case, I now have a second or third or fourth version of what should be a well-controlled well resource. And uh, just being able to encrypt something doesn't really, doesn't, doesn't really provide you the, Okay, you're talking, you're going back to the version control issue. Version. Yes. I can take, I it's not any version of your file. I can take your file and potentially distribute it. Yes. That's right. If I give you that right. The question is, what I'd like to be able to do is say, you can work with this file, but you can't take it. Ah. You might be able to add something to it or take something away from it, but you're not able to, effectively, you can't read it. You can manipulate it. This brings up a very interesting point. When we were working on this stuff, we had a debate that was a little bit like this. In fact, in some operating systems, they try to provide a kind of control that you can see if I you can give somebody the right to access something, but you but you can restrict it in such a way that they can't give it to somebody else. And we looked at that and we said that's nonsense. We came up with this concept we called the inalienable right to pass uh, to pass resource access and decided that, in fact, that kind of thing can't really be enforced. And if you think about it, you give somebody the right to access something, they can access it. If they want to, they can create a networked object, a new thing, that they send out through the network, that people then send a message back to them, and they do whatever it was on your resource and, uh, and turn the results back to them. As long as they have the ability to communicate, you can't stop them from passing those rights around. And in fact, trying to do so is in some sense counterproductive. You make them stand on their heads and do all these ridiculous things to do what they should be able to do anyway. That's right. Well, you can't. As long as you can communicate, I just pointed out that if you give somebody access to something, they can give anybody else access to it that they can communicate with. That's the inalienable right to access <laughs> uh, resources. Because I think it's about time to finish here. Uh, the speakers will be here, and you can ask them. Two clarification speakers will be around. For the record. 
Well, if you're going to ask, you might as well ask in the mic. No, well, yeah, it's real simple. Uh, no, no, they can answer. They can answer. Um, the NLTSS file system didn't do either file compression or encryption on its files, did it? That's right. It didn't. It didn't. Fact, even the capabilities, uh, it turns out, never were encrypted in the messages sent. We, John and I came up with this, with this marvelous uh, public key mechanism that I'd still like to get going on the Internet. Uh, that made the capabilities not only safe on the lines, but safe in memory and safe being passed in messages, but it was never implemented because the public key encryption was too slow. And so we just depended on the fact that, you know, it was all in a closed environment and uh, basically it wasn't a problem, which never would have really extended. I, I mean, anyway. Now our capabilities could be forged, but they could be stolen. But you could, That's right. You also, though, didn't consider compression you guys are just end up buying more storage, right? Sure. Yeah. Oh, one of the one of the sayings one of the sayings at Livermore in the early days was why use lead when gold will do. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Bob. <laughs> well, thanks to all the speakers this evening, to George and Dick and Jed and John. And so speakers will be a moment longer, you can ask individual questions. And thanks for the audience. Fine audience, yeah. <laughs>